Vatican police have broken up a gay orgy at the home of the secretary to one of Pope Francis's key advisors, it has been claimed. The flat belonged to the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, or Holy Office, which is in charge of tackling sexual abuse amongst the clergy. Reports in Italy claim the occupant of the apartment is the secretary to Cardinal Francesco Coco Palmerio, a key aide to the 80-year-old Pope. Coco Palmerio heads the Pontifical Council for Legislative Texts and was said to have once recommended his secretary for a promotion to bishop. The claims about the police raid last month were made in an anti-establishment Italian newspaper. The flat involved is a short distance from the Vatican itself. According to the paper, neighbours became suspicious before complaining about irregular behaviour of those coming and going at the flat. When police showed up, they reportedly found drugs and a group of men engaged in sexual activity. It is the latest scandal to hit the Vatican and comes after its finance chief, Cardinal George Pell, was charged with historical sexual offences. Pell has protested his innocence and said he was looking forward to having his day in court after a two-year investigation. Police have not revealed details of the charges against the 76-year-old, citing the need to preserve the integrity of the judicial process. Pell, who was appointed to clean up the Vatican's murky finances, has taken a leave of absence to defend himself against sex abuse charges in Australia. In March, the Vatican was hit with a wave of lurid accusations of misbehaving priests across Italy, with scandals involving orgies, prostitution and pornography. The claims were embarrassing to the Vatican, which under Pope Francis has attempted to demand high standards of the clergy. Francis has reportedly tried to clamp down on unethical behaviour ever since being made Pope in 2013 and has often spoken out against the pitfalls of temptation. Um. <clears throat> Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live via Skype from Holland with James Jacob Prash and this is the July 7th, 2017 Prophecy Update. Greetings in Jesus, dear friends, coming to you from The Hague in Holland, in the Netherlands. Uh, July 7th, year of our Lord, Anno Domine 2017. Let's begin with this week in prophecy. King Abdullah II of Jordan has made another secret trip to the United States. By secret, I don't mean clandestine, but unpublicized, unannounced. Meeting with Jared Kushner, meeting with Defense Secretary um, Mattis, meeting with Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly, and with other officials of the Trump administration. This was after the Trump administration considered bringing up all peace talks with Mahmoud Abbas over his continued support for terrorist activities perpetrated against Israelis and other targets in Israel and in the West Bank. Nonetheless, the meetings were held at a high level and discussed a way forward concerning what the prospects will be of any kind of real settlement, the question of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. This happened at the same time when Jordan, Jordan introduced resolutions in the UN condemnatory of Israel, using the language of occupation again, and faulting Israel for everything from archaeological excavations to construction in the area of East Jerusalem, of East Jerusalem. Uh, it is a very, very convoluted mess. It always, always harkens back to Zechariah 12. Jerusalem is a heavy stone, and all who lift it will be hurt previously. If King Abdullah II tries to lift that stone, he will be hurt. Now his name, Abdullah, he's named after his father's grandfather, King Abdullah I, who attempted to make peace with Israel at the dawn of the Jewish state. He was assassinated by the Mufti's men, people who were related, at least by clan, to the late Yasser Arafat in the mosque known as the Mosque of Aqsa on the Temple Mount. You can still see, and I have seen, the bullet holes in the pillars inside the mosque where his namesake, great-grandfather, was assassinated 
for trying to make peace with the Israelis. This is what happened to Anwar Sadat. This is what happened to Bashar Jamiel. And this is what would happen to anybody who tried to make peace with the Israelis. King Abdullah of Jordan cannot continue to play both sides of the equation. He needs to, to realize that his father gave up any claim to the West Bank. And although the Israelis have given the Jordanian government a say with the WAF, with the Temple Mount Authority, in the interest of stability, peace, and security, <coughs> Jordan seized the West Bank and East Jerusalem in 1948, it just unilaterally seized it, and then, following the 1967 war, it came under Israeli control until his father simply said, Jordan is no longer interested in that turf. It is now for the indigenous people to decide. The indigenous people, of course, are the Arabs who live there, who have been Jordanian citizens, and, of course, the real indigenous people of that land, the Israelis. King Abdullah would do himself well not to entangle himself in these kinds of arguments that are between the Palestinian Authority and the Israelis. We can see why in prophecy, in the book of Isaiah, it's not only Damascus, but Amman that is going to at some point be utterly, utterly devastated. It is going to be brought to utter ruins. Now, if the Palestinian Authority, if the Palestinian population of Jordan, which is 70%, deposes the Hashemite kingdom, of which he is presently monarch, we can see what would happen very easily. They would attack Israel, and the Israelis would be forced to attack them in self-defense. And what happened in 1967 would happen again. There would be an utter, utter destruction of Amman. Now, at some point, that is going to happen. On a more positive note, however, as we have pointed out before, the book of Daniel tells us something interesting and unique. It is only areas of Jordan, Edom and Moab, central and southern Jordan, who will somehow evade control of the Antichrist. This has all kinds of potential ramifications for believers to a degree, but especially for Israel and the Jews, uh, if there is to be an escape to Petra, as many people believe, as we essentially believe, it would explain how it could come about. Nonetheless, King Abdullah is back in Washington again, meeting with the Trump hierarchy, and the meetings have not been publicized, but they are prophetically important. Something else not being very publicized, but are also prophetically important, is the agreement brokered between Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Uh, King Salman, the islands at the entrance to the Gulf of Aqaba, known as Tehran and uh, Sanatir, right at the en southern entrance of the Gulf of Aqaba, to which the Israeli port and resort of Eilat uh, are reliant to allow free navigation had been ceded by Egypt to Saudi Arabia. Now, there may have been some economic interest in this, but the potential of something bad happening cannot be overlooked because that is what triggered the 1967 June War, a blockade at those very islands. The Israelis were forced by a blockade that was an act of war to attack it happened before. We should not think it cannot happen again. Let us understand the dilemma of King Salman and of Saudi Arabia at the moment. Islamic clerics, Wahhabis, who support the House of Saud in the agreement they have <coughs> to propagate Salafism and to maintain the strict Wahhabist legal code in Saudi Arabia, have a policy. A fatwa was issued by 60 Saudi clergy in 1988 and 89, this fatwa says, suicide bombings are a legitimate form of jihad and protest against the Israeli presence in what they call Palestine. And those who commit these acts of suicide terror are martyrs. 
Now we have to understand something. In Islam, the only assurance of, 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 of martyrdom, the only assurance of salvation, is to die a martyr's death. That is the only guarantee of, 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 of salvation eternally in Islam is to die a martyr's death. It's not like the Christian concept of the atonement of, of Christ, of, of Jesus, of Yeshua, substitutionary atonement for our sins. That is not their concept of a guaranteed salvation. Their concept of guaranteed salvation is to die in jihad. And they say suicide bombing is a legitimate expression of that. If it's directed against Israel, certainly. This was a decree of uh, Sheikh Saban al Auda in 1988-89. And he says that no Palestinian territory can be at any time occupied by Israel and there can be no peace with Israel as long as that is the case. In other words, as long as Israel exists. Now, this King Salman, he was charged by German intelligence of having financed radical Islamic terror in both Pakistan and in Bosnia. Given his background, what would stop him from sending jihadists into the Sinai via these islands? It's almost swimming distance. Not only that, but the House of Saud is in a very precarious position. You have a large Shia population in eastern Saudi Arabia, along the Persian Gulf, where most of the oil is concentrated. It's interesting that you have Saudi Arabia and other Islamic countries opposing Qatar now for its sponsorship of radical Islamic activity, but for some reason the Trump government is trying to broker a peace between the Saudis and the others opposing Qatar and Qatar itself, despite Qatar's support for terror. Again, all is not as prim and rosy with the Trump administration as we've warned before, but let's press on. All kinds of news coming from the Vatican in Rome this week in prophecy. Cardinal Mueller, Herr Mueller, from the Sacred College of the Propagation of Christian Doctrine, the Pontifical College with, that overlooks official Roman Catholic doctrine that issues the Nilet Obstats and the imprimatas in Roman Catholic literature and so forth. Uh, was, was basically removed for his conservatism by Pope Francis. In what is considered to be a big shakeup, Pope Francis has replaced Catholicism's top theologian, Cardinal Gerhard Ludwig Müller. Müller, a conservative German cardinal, has reportedly been at odds for a while with the pontiff's vision of a more inclusive church. In a statement from the Vatican Saturday, it was announced that Mueller's five-year term as head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith would not be renewed. The 69-year-old, who was appointed by former Pope Benedict in 2012, will reportedly be succeeded by the key department's second in charge, Archbishop Luis Francisco Ladaria Ferrer. Again, Pope Francis pushing further and further to the left to the chagrin and annoyance of traditional Catholics on everything from homosexuality to, to some people say abortion. But something else happened in the Vatican of note this week that was also underreported by the press. Inside the Vatican, the police raided an apartment and the apartment was owned almost absurdly by another Vatican officiat that is responsible for investigating sexual abuse of children and so forth. The police raided this particular apartment inside the Vatican because it was hosting homosexual sex orgies. Now again, this was an official, a, a high secretary to the senior clergyman responsible for investigating sexual abuse inside um, the Roman Catholic Church. Absurdity of absurdities. The people who are to investigate sexual corruption and who are in charge of investigating instances of sexual abuse 
I have the apartment rating, belonging to the Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith, in charge of these matters to do with sexual morality. It was a homosexual orgy. But again, Osservatorio Romano and the uh, Corriere della Sera, the Italian press, they play these things down. The corruption in the Vatican knows no end. But these things are only the beginning. The Vatican's finance at the moment are run by Australian Cardinal Pell, formerly Archbishop of Melbourne, Australia. Cardinal Pell was arrested, multiple charges in a summary and a, 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 yes, a summary prosecution announced by the Australian police authorities in Victoria, Australia this past week. Multiple, multiple charges of the sexual abuse of children by the man who financially runs the Roman Catholic Church, or at least who financially runs the Vatican. The Vatican's bank <laughs> is called the Ministry for religious works. That's what it's actually called, translated from Latin. And you'll see in Italy things like the Banco Spirito Santi, the, the Bank of the Holy Spirit, and the Catholic Bank of Venuto, and the Ambrosiano Bank, which is, was Vatican-owned. Going back to the P2 Lodge scandals and the Ambrosiano Bank scandal, the Vatican's paid hundreds of millions of dollars in compensation to people who were defrauded following the notorious Calvi murders in London. The Vatican, although it paid all this money to get itself out of trouble, denied any responsibility. Paul Marcinkus, an American bishop who was running the Vatican Bank at the time, was wanted for questioning by the Italian police authorities, but Pope John Paul II gave him refuge inside the Vatican City and refused to turn him over. That was John. That's the kind of man John Paul II really was, a protector of pedophiles and criminals. Well, there have been further allegations of corruption in the Vatican banks, the Vatican's bank, even since, all kinds of money laundering. But what's happened now is with Cardinal Pell. He's the most senior figure ever caught actually involved in pedophilia, according to the charges brought against him. This followed something that took place a little while ago with the arrest of the head of the Modesty Guard Committee. That's basically the Jewish equivalent in Meir Sharim in Jerusalem, or B'nai Brak near Tel Aviv, the ultra-Orthodox areas, of the Saudi Arabian Mutawa, the religious models police. Only what was happening is they were apprehending pedophiles within the yeshivas, who were molesting little yeshiva boys, and not telling the police, providing they got some kind of counseling within the Haredi community. They were not telling the police. Again, shielding of pedophiles by people who claim to be the morals police. As we've said before, just as Roman Catholicism is a theologically morally and spiritually bankrupt corruption of Christianity. Talmudic Judaism is a theologically, morally, and spiritually bankrupt version of Judaism. Neither one is scriptural, neither one is moral, neither one is of God. Sincere people are trapped in it, deceived by it, but pedophilia abounds in both. The Jackson Report was finally issued in the UK looking at Islamic radicalism inside Great Britain. Predictably, Theresa May, who's basically a political prostitute, there's never been anything other than a political prostitute, she has the morals of a, a political prostitute, is withholding the report in order to placate the Saudi Arabian government in the House of Saud. The report plainly states that Saudi Arabia is the chief and quintessential funder of Islamist extremism and radical views of Islam, including the implementation of jihad on democratic Western countries and the application of Wahhabist law. 
The report states this and makes it clear that it is funding what amounts to interpretations of the Islamic religion that engender support for terror and violence. Even though the Saudis are not doing it themselves, they're funding educational programs and propaganda programs that cultivate a mentality conducive to the terror. But Theresa May, being what she is and what she isn't, is of course suppressing it. This is the same Theresa May who at the behest of Barack Obama, of course, voted against Israel and UNESCO, saying that Israel has no claim to the Wailing Wall as a historical or religious site by any traditional or legal justification. Story goes on. Newsweek reporter Tom O'Connor, the man who should get the reward for journalistic dishonesty if there was a Pulitzer Prize for it, he should get it. It's not the first time he's done something like this. He has written an article in Newsweek, basically a financially insolvent publication. I don't know why it's still around and hasn't folded up. That Al-Nisra, a radical branch of ISIS, is supported by the Israelis, which the Israelis obviously deny. His source, however, is the Syrian army <laughs> of Assad. He claims his source is an Israeli newspaper, but the Israeli newspaper denies it. It simply cited a claim of the Syrian army of Assad. But of course, O'Connor did not say this. Good riddance, Newsweek. I hope you go the way of the New York Times. The New York Times has laid off 50% of its copy editors this past week. It needs to lay off the rest of them. In fact, the publication needs to close down. But let's move on. In Halifax, Canada, a homosexual pride parade is losing sponsors. Now understand the reason. Because Jewish and Israeli homosexual and lesbian activists are participating. <laughs> so sponsors of a homosexual march will not support the march or not sponsor it if Jews and Israelis who are homosexuals and lesbians participate in it. This has become the absolute theater of the absurd. Mr. Trump and Mr. Putin have met at the G20 summit. They have tentatively agreed to some kind of a Syrian ceasefire. I will believe that when it happens. This is coming about for the simple reason that ISIS as a caliphate is finished. It's now essentially finished. With the collapse of Mosul, Mosul this week, it'll largely be over as a territorial entity. Mr. Trump did what he said he was going to do, wipe them out. They're finished. The danger is, as we pointed out last week, that they would reinvent themselves as a partisan movement. Al-Qaeda is expecting many of them to rejoin Al-Qaeda and continue their quote-unquote jihad following the fall of Mosul, of Mosul. New York City. Jewish cultural capital of the world. There's a petition to Lincoln Center, signed by 60 artists and writers, including four Pulitzer Prize winners, to ban an Israeli play. Nobody wants to ban Saudi Arabian plays or any kind of Islamic plays. It's always the Israelis. And this is in New York City. Liberal idiocy gone mad. Right after a Afro-American or Afro-Hispanic policewoman was shot dead in the Bronx. Instead of attending her funeral, Mr. de Blasio flew off to Germany to protest Donald Trump at the G20 summit. These people are crazy. These people are crazy. A young policewoman, mother of three kids, shot dead in the Bronx. And he isn't going to have the decency as the mayor to go to her funeral because he had a fly to Europe to protest Donald Trump. So, Greg, I know that you're hard on the protesters, and here is their keynote speaker, mm -hmm. our mayor, 
Bill de Blasio. I'd call him human garbage, but why insult garbage? Oh, no. You know, he's skipping the, a police ceremony to egg on people who attack the police. Mm. He may not throw a brick, but he's legitimizing the mayhem. You know, no wonder people in New York City hate him. Homelessness is up 40%. They're finding corpses in the ponds at Central Park. A police officer is getting executed, and his priority is a global idea, not about New York City. There's only, a, there's only really one reason why he became mayor, because the two previous mayors dramatically improved the city yeah. so much that you could actually take a risk on this bozo. You could actually <laughs> expend the capital that has that w grew under uh, um, Giuliani and even in Bloomberg. I wish we could go back to those mayors because this is really it's a, this is the world's greatest city and we have the world's worst mayor who skipped town. If, if he was so proud of this, why did he tell anybody? Why did he leave without telling anybody? He's an embarrassment. Well, Sorry. so Lisa, he, apparently yesterday, Greg and I were joking about this, was welcome to hell. That's what the protesters, the anti-globalists, the anarchists had to say. But this event that he's going, that the mayor's going to speak at tomorrow is called Hamburg Shows Attitude. And apparently the mayor, de Blasio, says it's important that Americans be there to show that we have a variety of opinions. No, I mean, let's call this what it is. He's shirking his responsibilities in search of the political spotlight. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to build his national profile, and he's ignoring important things that he should be doing here in New York to do so. But look, police unions in 2014 accused him for encouraging and fostering an anti-police environment that led yep. to the death of two police officers. So does it really surprise anyone that once again he's skipping out something that is important for men and women in blue uh, to then stand with protesters and stand with these rioters who are literally burning down cars and burning down a city. Well, it, should, fair, it should come to the surprise of no one. Well, to be fair to him, he says he'll be back for the funeral uh, that's going to be held this weekend. How nice of him. Oh, I'm sure that he'll I'm, be very welcome uh, when he gets there. Interesting about the, the protesters or thugs, whatever we're calling them. You know, I'd love to know where they're all coming from and if they work. Because what they're protesting are basically the system that we all are living under and that we are trying to basically make livings in order to fund government services, of which I would imagine many of them are actually on. And they're disguised, by the way. Let's not forget. They're all dressed in black. Yep. Is that, how is that peaceful, if not, it's more intimidating and fascist to dress in a uniform in disguise. And many in masks. Yeah, in masks. So, oh. so I want to ask you about the politics of this, Jesse. So is he, as Lisa suggested, simply raising his profile? Do you think he's campaigning to be a possible Democratic contender Ooh. for 2020? Oh, do I hope so, Juan. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see Republicans run the against Blasio that guy. versus Trump. Oh, it doesn't get any oh, better please. than that. Throw Warren on the ticket, we have a real, real fun campaign. Um, any event where de Blasio is the keynote speaker is a terrible event. <laughs> I will say this, back. though. I know why he went. <laughs> no, His do. son yeah. is studying abroad in Germany. Yes, uh, and okay. you know when your son or your daughter is studying abroad in Europe, you happen to make a trip over there. Free ticket. Visit them. Exactly. Right. So what he did was he didn't want to pay for it. Right. So he got this left-wing group like to say, hey, come over. Kill two birds with one son. I got oh this invitation. Gosh, I go see that. my son. Yep. But it's terrible timing because the guy always steps in it. He can't, he can't plow the streets. The subways don't run, the trains are all broken, there's homeless people everywhere, NYPD officers are turning their back to him. He is the worst mayor New York City has ever uh, had, but we me. don't have anybody running against him. Oh, yes. this is what I was going to say. We I don't have anybody. All of you. Oh, so Kimberly Guilfoyle. Jesse Waters is announcing Waters. his candidacy. Uh, you know, no <laughs> chance. No nice right committee oh, right here. <laughs> what are you going to do in the second term, Dana? You're just going to flip out? Well, no, he, well, this is the truth. Like, he won by, some, uh, by yeah. there was not, there was a, how much wasn't was not turnout? It was like, <laughs> it, 30, it was a 30% turnout, right? 30 percent turnout. Yeah. And, and like, apparently yeah. his people turned out. Yeah. Ahead. As Michael Savage said, liberalism is a mental disorder. Uh, pray for Michael Savage. He's an unsaved Jew, and I'd love to see him come to faith in Yeshua the Messiah. I'd like to see Mark Levin another unsaved Jew come to faith in Yeshua the Messiah. I'd love to see Ben Shapiro, another unsaved Jew, come to faith in Yeshua the Messiah. I'd love to see David Horowitz, another unsaved Jew, come to faith in Yeshua the Messiah. I'd love to see Dennis Prager, another unsaved Jew, come to faith in Yeshua the Messiah. All of these people were from backgrounds like my own. They were left-wing people 
who saw through the left and moved to a conservative direction. Well, they moved in the right direction politically. My prayer and my heart's cry is that they will now move in the right direction spiritually and theologically and come to faith in their own Messiah. At Al-Ram, near Jerusalem, Israeli authorities uncovered a weapons factory, completely illegal. We're supposed to believe that Mr. Abbas did not know about it, but the game just goes on, just goes on. The third biggest athletic event in the world after the Olympics and the Commonwealth Games is the Maccabiah, the Jewish Olympics, as it were, and it's about to take off in Jerusalem this week. You will see competition of Jewish athletes from all over the world, but something happened a few years ago. Pastor Bill Randall's in Iowa had a wrestling team of pro Zionist saved evangelical young people that with partial sponsoring from our ministry, Moriel, were a Christian group allowed to participate in the Jewish Olympics, the Maccabiah. And they were able to wear jerseys, wrestling shirts, sports shirts for the competition that said Zachariah 12 on them. That look upon me who they have pierced and worn as one more for an only son. Well, the Israelis, the secular Israelis who ran the Maccabiah, welcomed them and were appreciative of Christians who were supporting Israel and to see these young people so enthusiastic about Israel. And they were asking them about the shirts that we got for them. And they were telling them and it was an opportunity. Uh, sport opens doors. Even some of the most closed countries in the world, such as Albania under the communists, would allow athletes in, and some of them were Christians. Uh, yes, the world uses sports, the devil uses sports, it's a thing of the world. But there are Christian athletes who have a testimony for Jesus, outspokenly so. The founder of Christians in Sport is a Jewish believer, Eddie Wax. Quite a guy, I'm told, by all accounts. Uh, may God bless the Maccabiah, and may there be a strong witness for Yeshua during it. Well, back to the United States. If the poll is accurate, it's rather stunning. 58% of Democratic voters now say that the Democratic Party in the United States needs new leadership. Look at the feminist left. Linda Salser. Linda Salser, a jihad-wearing Islamic fundamentalist who defends the Saudi Arabian treatment of women. I hope that we, when we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad, that we are struggling against tyrants and rulers, not only abroad in the Middle East or in the other side of the world, but here in these United States of America where you have fascists and white supremacists and Islamophobes reigning in the White House. That's their spokeswoman. She says, you can't be a feminist and support Israel and Zionism. What are these stupid left-wing Jewish American feminist women doing having a woman like that at the helm? Absolute, unbelievable idiocy. The corruption. Barbara Brazil caught lying. Washington Schultz caught lying. Where does it end? Hillary Clinton never done anything but lie. Well, they know they need new leadership. <coughs> I don't want to see the Democratic Party get new leadership. I'm very happy with their leadership. As long as you have someone like Nancy Pelosi, who says we have to pass Obamacare, a 1,300-page piece of legislation the congressman got on their desks the night before it was to be voted on, saying, we have to pass this thing to find out what's in it. As long as you have somebody that moronic as your leader, that's a good thing for conservatives. No, I don't want to see the Democrats get new leadership. I like their leadership. I think it's fantastic. I want to see them keep people like Nancy Pelosi. I want to see them keep people like Hillary Clinton. I think it's a great thing. That's my own view, of course.
But what does this have to do with prophecy? I have been saying that God is giving the American and British nations a period of temporary respite. The Anglo-American world is getting respite. With Brexit and with the defeat of Hillary Clinton, it is God's mercy. Let's press on. Let's see what else is transpiring this week in prophecy. Krakow, Poland. UNESCO. Mayor Tassir Abu Serin, who in 1980 murdered six Jewish yeshiva students, addressed the United Nations World Heritage Conference, or committee, the, the, the conference of the committee. In UNESCO 2012, the Church of the Nativity, the Betar battle site from Bar Kokhba's rebellion in the second century, and even now the Wailing Wall in 2017, are being challenged as locations where the Jews have any right or claim, or where Christians have any right or claim. Only the Palestinian Muslims do, according to the UN given the fact that there's 57 Islamic countries and is the biggest faction in the UN, and given the fact that Western politicians lick the boots of Saudi Arabians, some more than others, I wonder why that happens. Nonetheless, this took place in Krakow. There was also a speaker, however, from the Simon Weisenthal Institute. At least both sides of the story were put across. But UNESCO has now gone further. UNESCO has decided this week in prophecy that the tomb of the patriarchs built over the scriptural cave of Machpelah, the graves of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the graves of their wives, of Sarah, <laughs> and of Rivka, Rebecca, and of Leah, that that is a Palestinian site. The Jews have no claim to the second holiest site in Judaism, the birthplace of the patriarchs, says the United Nothing, UNESCO. It is time for Congress and the Trump administration to stop funding UNESCO. It's an Islamic charade. Speaking of Islamic charades, the Swiss-born Muslim academic at Harvard University Tariq Ramadan has this week in prophecy defended an Islamic imam in Virginia who is supportive of female genital mutilation, clitorectomy. He wants it in the United States as it exists in most Muslim countries. The thinking of the Muslims who subscribe to it and many, probably a majority do in Islamic countries is that sexual pleasure is for men only. There is a clitorectomy performed on little girls before they become sexually active. So any sexual pleasure will be reserved only for the male. Females undergo this genital mutilation. This is the belief of many Muslims. And we have a Islamic imam who should not even be allowed in the United States, but who is in Virginia wanting it to take place in the United States. Now, there is no equivalence between circumcision and female circumcision. Male circumcision has been scientifically proven since the 1930s to reduce smegma bacillus, resulting in lower vaginal cancer rates in women. When it was first discovered, there was statistically less vaginal cancer in Jewish women. It is a hygienic function that has a religious symbolism attached to it, but it does not detract from sexual pleasure of any circumcised male. <coughs> Yet, a false equivalency is argued for. You can watch films of these little girls in Africa <coughs> and in Arab countries being held down, screaming, while their clitoris is sliced off, often with a rusty razor or some kind of other makeshift surgical instrument, on deceptive conditions. Of course, in the United States, they want it done 
<coughs> as a proper medical procedure. Well, this is defended. This imam who wants this in America is actually defended by this Oxford professor born in Switzerland, Tariq Ramadan. Female genital mutilation of these girls is barbaric. It is a savage act of barbarism. It is an act of heathen savages. There are Muslims who do not agree with it, but those who do are heathen savages. In the case of Tariq Ramadan, this proves you can have an educated Muslim, an Oxbridge professor, who's nothing but a heathen savage in his mind. It doesn't matter how westernized he likes to look, how educated he is, anybody who is supportive of female genital mutilation is nothing but a heathen savage, a barbarian who needs to be recognized and treated as one. Yet he's an Oxford professor. Why do we let people like this into Britain and America? Why should any civilized country allow these heathen savages into the civilized world? They're not civilized. If they behave like barbarians, they should be identified barbarians and treated as barbarians. Following Tunisia and Lebanon, Qatar has now banned the movie Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman has been something of a salvation to box office plundered Hollywood. It's so far bought in nearly 800 million in box office sales, a huge blockbuster after a decade of major decline in profitability of Hollywood films. Why has Qatar joined two other Arab countries in banning it? Because the actress, Gal Gadot, is Jewish because the actress is an Israeli Jew. Therefore, that's grounds to ban Wonder Woman. Uh, should we ban this Arab films? Should civilized countries ban films from Islamic countries? Well, it's always a one-way street with them. Back to Israel. Although it is not publicized, something is happening on the eastern slope of the Golan Heights where we were a few weeks ago filming. What is happening is this. The Israelis are creating a buffer zone during the, in the most vulnerable areas opposite Kunitra. That would be about 12 miles long and 6 miles wide in order to prevent Iranian Revolutionary Guards and their surrogates from reaching the Israeli border fence. It's underway. It's being done in a very low-key way, but it is certainly being implemented, and it has to be. Again, nobody's talking about it, but the forces of the Assad, who are in bed with the Iranians, supported by Mr. Putin, are a threat to Israel's border security on the Golden Heights, in the area just to the uh, south of Mount Hermon. The Israelis are responding, as they're forced to do. But going now down to Gaza, the rival within the Palestinian Authority of Mr. Mahmoud Abbas is Mohammed Dalen. Dalen is in a self-imposed exile, and he's made a statement this week in prophecy that is rather astounding. He accuses the Israelis of supporting Mr. Abbas's campaign against Hamas in Gaza. And he says that the Israelis continue to cooperate with Mr. Abbas against Gaza and against Hamas, that Hamas will be forced to retaliate by attacking Israel. So, because one group of Arab Muslim Palestinians Palestinian Arab Muslims are attacking another. If you don't stop doing this, we're going to attack Israel. The president of Germany, to his credit, not Herr Merkel, not Fräulein Merkel, but the president of Germany has nobly spoken out against the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe 
and in Germany. Uh, this came the same week when Germany has agreed to sell three new nuclear-capable submarines to Israel. Be that as it may, Benjamin Netanyahu was this past week in prophecy in Germany for the funeral of Helmut Kohl, where he met with a number of European leaders and Bill Clinton, who eulogized Helmut Kohl. There's been a rise of anti-Semitism in Germany. We reported the outrage of a decision of a German court saying that an act of hatred perpetrated against Jews was only a political act, not a hate crime. Same as what happened to the Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Fortunately, this president of Germany follows in the tradition of Konrad Adenauer. And he nobly, to his credit, has taken out a position publicly and taken a stand speaking out against this rise of anti-Semitism taking place in Europe generally and Germany included. So President Walter Steinmeier, we salute you and we thank God for your integrity. May God bless you. I don't know if you know Jesus, but if you don't, I hope you do come to know him very soon. He's also a Jew and he loves you. He died for your sins as he did mine, and he will bless those who bless Israel. And this week in prophecy, sir, you have blessed Israel. So I ask you, is all well? Was ist los, mein Kameraden? Alles gut? Ich weiß nicht. I don't know. But I do know this. You're a real mensch. You're a big man. Du bist ein großer Mensch. Also this week, something that's been in place since October of 2015, an Israeli government ban on members of the Israeli government or Knesset ascending to the Temple Mount. That ban has now been lifted and they may return to the Temple Mount. Lifted this week by Mr. Netanyahu. Again, underreported in the press, but prophetically the significance. You will now have Jewish leaders once again going up to the Temple Mount where the Temple had stood. Well, the story then continues. In the meeting of the G20 summit, one of the issues that's going to be raised is the sad saga of a child in the UK sentenced to death by the European courts. Very ugly situation. Mr. Trump and Mr. Pence have been willing to take this child into the United States for an experimental therapy. Now, the odds of this therapy working are very slim. This child needs much, much prayer, as does his parents, or as do his parents. It's not an easy situation. Medically and statistically, it's unlikely this child is going to survive. Nonetheless, if it was your baby, and People sent you 1.3 million pounds, two million dollars, to pay the medical costs for this experimental treatment that can only take place in the United States. If even the Vatican, the Vatican Hospital, agreed to take the child off the hands or from the hands and responsibility of Great Ormond Street Hospital, pediatric hospital in London, and if the President of the United States is willing to host and facilitate the transfer of the child to the United States for this experimental treatment. Why should this child be sentenced to absolute certain death in the name of protecting its rights? This is how crazy the left-wing European courts are. Yet, that's the reality. And it's a reality that makes no sense to anybody but the socialist bureaucrats who make these kinds of decisions. It's something that's quite heartbreaking when we look at the plight of the parents of little Charlie Gard. Uh, he has mitochondrial depletion syndrome. Again, his chances of survival are very, very slim. But if there's any chance to save the life of a baby, you've got to take it. 
if it's viable. The Great Ormond Street says they can't do it. They don't believe he's going to live. Fair enough. But let it be a medical decision. If there's other medical scientists and physicians in the state say it's worth a shot, fair enough. Let it be a medical decision. <coughs> but instead, it's become a politically driven legal decision. Judges outstripping their professional qualification and bounds. No, the child should be allowed to get the medical treatment. The odds are against him. But with God, all things are possible. If people sent that money and the parents want it and the Americans are willing to do it, send the kid to the States. He's a little baby. Give him what little chance he has if that's what his parents want and believe. The prayers of us all are with little Charlie God and with his family. May the Lord help him. To Turkey! <clears throat> We've warned that Turkey is heading for financial insolvency under its present leader, who wants to reverse the Turkey of Turkey's modern founder, Atatürk. Mr. Erdogan is not a nice man. This week in prophecy, he has again attacked American-backed Kurdish forces. He doesn't like Kurds because he thinks that any Kurdish entity will threaten Turkish occupation of portions of Kurdistan as the Kurds would see it. He, of course, would see it differently. He's no friend of America, but they need the Incivic Air Base to carry out operations against Syria, and they do not want him over aligned with Mr. Putin. It's all politics. But as he pushes Turkey, in a less and less democratic direction, and a more and more Sharia direction. <coughs> this week in prophecy, thousands and thousands and thousands of civilized Turks, <coughs> Turkish moderates, moderate Muslims, marched to Turkey protesting him. Since the failed military coup, there's been a general crackdown in Turkey. It has not been easy for anyone who's opposed it. But there are people in Turkey trying to see that nation sovereign from the clutches of this person who seems intent on a Gog Magog scenario. Turkey is at a fork in the road. It can go one of two ways. After the failed coup, it began going in the way towards a Gog and Magog scenario, it would seem. But there are people trying to resist this. Turks who are westernized, who want friendly relations with Israel, and who do not like what Erdogan is doing. Nonetheless, Erdogan this week has begun seizing the properties of the Syriac Christian minority in Turkey, just grabbing church lands, church buildings. This is one of the oldest Christian small c sex in the world. Having the Aramaic scriptures in the Syriac alphabet preserved in their monasteries and so forth. But the Erdogan regime has begun grabbing their properties, grabbing their monasteries, doing what he always does. The man is a reprehensible thug in the eyes of many moderate Turks and of other people. Mr. Trump was in Poland this week. Mr. Trump drew a broad equivalency between the atrocities perpetrated in Poland by the Nazis and those perpetrated by the Soviets. Mr. Putin would not find favor with this. But Mr. Putin is not finding favor with many things. American efforts to bring new sanctions against North Korea in the United Nations have been vetoed in the Security Council by Mr. Putin's Russia. Canada, the United States, Britain, these countries, it doesn't matter what they say. It only matters that Russia 
has a veto, as does America and Britain and so forth, and it's using it. Putin does not want anything other than a Korea that's destabilized and a threat to Western interests. China is the same. The only way to deal with this is to make them pay a price. What neither China or Russia do want is a nuclearized Western Pacific. Until now, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, they've been happy to remain under the protection of the American nuclear umbrella. The next move in the chess game would be the threat of Japan for mostly, possibly Taiwan and South Korea developing a nuclear arsenal of their own, and the return of American nuclear weapons to the Korean Peninsula now that North Korea has them. This would not be in the interest of Russia or China, and it is probably the only viable move that America and Japan and South Korea have. Some people think there should be a decoupling of the United States from South Korea, and America should face North Korea with Japan on its own terms. Enough Americans have died defending South Korea. Enough money has been spent by America defending South Korea. There are trade imbalances, and it's not in our interest to be there. The card North Korea plays is if you attack us, we will attack Seoul. But if South Korea is not a factor in the equation anymore. Maybe they won't attack Seoul, and we can just go and do what needs to be done. What else has transpired this week in prophecy? Let's go to Canada. Incredibly in Canada, the pandering to Islam by the government of Justin Trudeau. <coughs> and I don't mean to moderate Islam. I mean to terrorist Islam. <coughs> has reached an almost unbelievable state of affairs that would have been un unimaginable under his predecessor, Mr. Harper. Specifically, two things. He has an Islamic Minister of Citizenship. This Islamic Minister of Citizenship in Canada, who's in charge of the immigration and citizenship policies of Canada, states that radical Islamic terrorists, radical Islamic terrorists who immigrated to Canada as radicals and have committed terrorist acts while in Canada are still Canadian citizens, should not be denationalized and should not be deported to the countries from which they came. Does that make any sense to anybody other than to Mr. Trudeau? Ahmed Hussein, the Minister of Citizenship, says that Zacharias Amiria is to stay in Canada when he's released from prison for terrorist acts. But that's only the beginning. Another Islamic terrorist in Canada is to be paid over $10 million in compensation for the time he spent in prison in Guantanamo when he threw a hand grenade that killed an American Army sergeant in the Special Forces. He threw a hand grenade. He killed an American Special Forces sergeant sent to Guantanamo. He was sent to a Canadian prison in a program where he would be able to finish his sentence in Canada as a Canadian, but now he is to get paid $10 million in compensation for killing an American soldier with a hand grenade. The left-wing Canadian idiocracy, which is as bad as the American left-wing idiocracy, has determined that he's some kind of a victim because he was only a teenager when he did it. And so he will collect his 10 million as his reward for killing an American with a hand grenade. This is the policy of the government of Mr. Trudeau in Canada. This is madness. 
you had an Islamic radical pull out a gun and begin shooting up the Canadian Parliament in Ottawa. You've had terrorist attacks inside Canada. And you've had people in Canada looking to use Canada as a base to attack the United States. Who are radical Islamists. Nonetheless, the Canadian government appears to be on their side. But what does this have to do with prophecy? Again, as I've said 100 times or more, radical Islam is God's judgment on a backslidden Judeo-Christian world. In Canada this week also, a Canadian mother said she does not want the gender of her newborn baby on the birth certificate. That's got to be determined if it's a boy or a girl at some later point. Forget about X and Y chromosomes. <laughs> no, the gender has to be determined at some future point. And she's made legal appeal to do this in Canada. How has Canada flipped so quickly? It seems to be a country that's gone mad. It's increasingly pandering to Islam, that is to radical Islam, even to terrorist Islam. And it seems to be increasingly anti-Christian. Uh, I can say more about that, but I'd rather not, as Moriel still has an appeal pending. But, you know, lesbian groups and uh, Islamic activist groups, these people get tax deductible status with relative ease in Canada. My question is, why don't Christian organizations seem to get it? Quite a thing. Quite a thing indeed. But that is what Canada has come to. Canada does not have a kind of evangelical heritage that is very strong. Never has had. Part of Canada, a major part of Canada, was Roman Catholic, of course, Quebec. You have had Mennonites in the western provinces. Some of them still believe, others have gone into theological liberalism. Uh, please pray for Canada. Canada needs major change spiritually, and Canada needs major change in its government policies. Really major change. It's heading for something terrible. Something terrible is going to happen in Canada, or something terrible is going to come out of Canada. It is not only the Mexican border that will need to be defended, it'll be the Canadian border because of the relative ease by which the Canadian government as a matter of policy panders to radical Islam and lets these people into their country and seemingly lets them get away with things that no sensible country ever would. But that's the way it is. Finally, again in the Middle East, if you can believe it, the chief of Hamas, Ismail Haniya, is proposing a prisoner swap. 1,200 Hamas terrorists held in Israeli detention. 1,200 for the corpses of two dead Israelis. You couldn't make this stuff up. Again, you're dealing with people with a mentality that only understands strength. It does not understand civility as anything other than weakness. You cannot show kindness to a radical Islam until you show them strength. After you show them strength, they can respond to kindness. But unless you show them strength, they're going to see your kindness. It's going to be interpreted automatically as weakness. Lastly, one of the Supreme Court justices, Mr. Kennedy, appointed by Ronald Reagan, one of the Judases of the Reagan administration, one of the Benedict Arnolds, a, ju a judicial Benedict Arnold, appointed by Reagan, came in as a pretended conservative and has voted consistently almost with the left. He was considered to be something of a swing voter, but he wasn't like Mr. Scalia. He was a Judas, like Sandra Day O'Connor, appointed by Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan 
wanted to stack the Supreme Court with, 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 with Judas's. And he was such a Judas. So was Chief Justice Roberts. Chief Justice Roberts, of course, rewrote Obamacare as a tax, even though it was not passed as a tax. He directly legislated from the bench. He rewrote it. No constitutional authority for doing it. Congress passes the laws, and they did not pass it as a tax. Roberts rewrote it. Again, another Republican, another judicial Judas. I've warned repeatedly that Nixon, Reagan, Eisenhower, Earl Warren, Warren Berger, Roe versus Wade, banning prayer in schools, all of these things came from Republicans. Banning the Ten Commandments from the Judicial Building in Alabama, Sandra Day O'Connor, Ronald Reagan's appointee. Do not trust the Republican Party establishment. Do not trust them or believe them. Do not subscribe even to the myth of Ronald Reagan. He said one thing, but he did quite another, appointing pro-abortion justices to the Supreme Court. That was Ronald Reagan. Well, one of his Judases this week, Kennedy, is rumored, according to reports of some of the Supreme Court clerks, to be planning on retiring. Let's hope he does, and let's hope and pray that Mr. Trump appoints a replacement like Mr. Gorsuch again, another Mr. Gorsuch. I thank God for Mr. Gorsuch, for Clarence Thomas, the Afro-American jurist, but we need more of them. We need fewer Kagans. We need fewer so to my ears. And we need no Robertses, no Kennedys, no more Sandra Day O'Connors, and that insufferable, terrible old woman, Ginsburg. Please pray that the Lord removes these people and that constitutionalists who are grounded in the Judeo-Christian foundations of our nation of America as a society become the next generation of Supreme Court justices. During this undeserved period of respite that the Lord is showing the Anglo-American world. That is this week in prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash, coming to you from The Hague in Holland. Now, beginning next month, we're going to have a midweek Second Coming of Jesus Bible study, probably each Wednesday. Preparations are already underway. Please be praying for it. We will introduce it, Lord willing, in August, a midweek Bible study, always on the Second Coming of Jesus. Visit us next time, visit us next week, enjoy the other teachings on the internet, but that has been This Week in Prophecy. God bless and thank you for listening. speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea. It's an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. 
the dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be shadows of the beast, shadows of the beast, how the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, the Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo. All available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.